Right, hello, good afternoon. Uh, my name's Dr Angela Granger. I am the Assistant Director of Nursing. I lead on nurse education and research and very recently I moved from the Nursing Executive Directorate into um, HR and Organisational Development. So I'm starting my talk with what sounds like a funny thing happened to me on the way to a conference because I've just come back Please notice the tan. I don't tan very easily, but I've just come back from two weeks in Florida this morning to find that um, in moving my file drives on the computer system from one division to another, they've actually deleted them. <laughs> Hence, I'm talking to you rather than showing you fancy slides. Luckily, I do know what I'm talking about, I assure you. But actually, it does bring into... Um, into the right to the front of things I'm saying to you which is if you're going to do anything digital skills wise ICT wise you have got to have a skilled ICT department to a help implement the system and b sort out any problem solving and dramatic events because you can imagine it was pretty dramatic when I found that everything had gone I could get my emails that's about it but they assure me that they will find it and I do hope so, because there's millions and millions of files containing all sorts of important work that I need to build on, so they need to retrieve it. But they're usually pretty good, so I'm sure they will. But it also goes to show that when I'm talking to you from an employer's perspective about ICT and digital skills, we mustn't forget that the only reason that we in the health service have this sort of backup system is for continuity of patient care. So exactly the same principles exist and are important whether you're using paper documentation or as in the case of my particular trust, King's College Hospital NHS Foundation Trust, which now has five sites across South East London and right out through Kent, they're all going to paperless and onto digital skills. So, even though it's not paper, people still have to be reminded, that's all the users, from student nurses to healthcare assistants to um, admin and clerical people who are using the system to medical staff and dental staff and nurses and midwives. In fact, anybody who's going to use the system all have to be reminded regularly through updates um, <coughs> of the legal requirements to do with... Um, governance and quality assurance that are to do with information governance and information governance covers confidentiality it also covers the if you're going to breach confidentiality in a, a legal way that is allowed because of adult or child safeguarding issues that it's on a need to know basis to another relevant professional and from the type of data that you are releasing and the way in which you are releasing that data <coughs> that people can see that that is on a need to know basis because otherwise you have breached the um, Human Rights Act of breach of confidentiality um, as well as the common law legalities that we have in this country around confidentiality uh, and any breaches of that for a healthcare organisation results in not only severe chastisement and public shaming in the newspapers, but huge amounts of fines. And in some cases, you're not allowed to run that system anymore. You can actually be debarred from using that system, which when you're talking about healthcare and medical records, um, that's huge. Sorry, did you want to say? I'm so sorry to interrupt you, but I signed up to go to the law stream one. Okay, that's fine. I think that's downstairs sorry. somewhere. Uh, Karen will tell you where, yeah. Okay, that's all right. That's okay. Thank you. All right. Okay. Now, 
Now you might think, well that's okay, talking about information governance, talking about confidentiality, but of course there are also the Caldecott guardi guidelines, um, which are guardianship of all research activity. And in a university teaching hospital, one expects to find uh, professors of medicine and surgery and other principal investigators doing a lot of research. But also many of our business management people are doing research for their MBAs, and also many of our nurses and midwives are doing their first piece of empirical research for their master's degrees. And they too are bound by Caldecott Research Governance. And we have to have a system, ICT system, digital skills system, that has tracking of who is doing what on the system, what data they are using and to what purposes they are putting that data toward, um, it can be easily tracked and therefore any breaches um, of information governance or research governance will actually be flagged up through an adverse incident reporting system, which is integral to the actual use of the ICT system. So that's one way for patient medical records, continuity of patient care, tracking of patient information. But also with a large organisation like King's College Hospital that employs over 12,000 staff of all disciplines, there is also from an organisational development point of view ongoing training and education for all staff. And part of that <coughs> will be in using the system, obviously, and that is why I go back to what I said at the beginning, which is that you've got to have an ICT um, department that can support the implementation of ICT systems and their developments and also provide not only problem solving but ongoing training for the staff that are going to use those systems. If you've got 12,000 staff spread across five different organisational units in a wide geographical area, that is going its sum. And one of the things I think we found possibly in the Trust um, is that we don't have sufficient ICT trainers to do all of electronic patient record training to absolutely everybody because everything now in the trust is electronic everything from patient prescriptions to patient medical records patient nursing records patient dental records fluid balance charts clinical observation charts and one of the things that we have recently invested some time and money in is that when you're doing clinical observations now, um, the system actually interprets. So of course, when I trained years ago, I didn't quite pick up the lamp from Florence Nightingale, but it wasn't far off. Um, a lot of our skills and training was interpreting patients clinical observations and whether they were in a stable condition, whether they were deteriorating or whether indeed they were showing signs of improvement. Now there is a calculation in built into the system which shows whether your patient has an early warning score which is meant to help predict and identify those patients who are in the early stages of deterioration and who need to be escalated to see a doctor quite urgently. Yeah? And we've picked up many patients who had that minor adjustment in BP, that smallish spike in temperature which actually indicates a DVT which may go on to a pulmonary embolism would not have been detected quite so early if it was pure manually and individual cognitive interpretation. Okay. So the other thing um, that I'm hoping that the next stage will be is thinking about um, the math skills, the calculation skills of several of the um, nursing and um, healthcare assistant staff. We know that uh, calculation skills and maths generally are for whatever reason not well taught in the United Kingdom and certainly we do expect staff who are being recruited to us to do a basic unseen English comprehension paper and also a numerical calculations paper, whoever they are. But even so I find um, that actually totting up fluid balance charts at midnight for healthcare assistants who are on night duty seems to be becoming quite a difficult task. And with the advent now of more patients becoming susceptible to AKI, acute kidney injury, and the early identification of sepsis, keeping an eye on fluid balance is very particularly important and to know whether the patient is in positive balance or actually in negative balance. So I'm working with Richard, who's one of our senior ICT people, on trying to inbuild um, a calculation system 
for each fluid balance chart for each patient that is part of their individualised um, medical record on the system. Yeah? So all patients are still uh, anonymised, they have a name of course, but actually everything is done through their unique and one-off um, patient case reference number because you'd be amazed how many patients have the same or very similar sounding name who are of the same or very similar age, um, whose date of birth isn't that different, you know, who might be on the same wards. And it is problematic. It is one of the things that uh, leads to problems and with patients having um, erroneous treatments or double medication or whatever. So we're trying to build that in, but particularly with fluid balance charts, it's something that is considered to be such a routine thing sometimes to have patients on a fluid balance chart. And uh, my view on it <coughs> is that it's becoming so routine that people are forgetting the significance of what patients are on a fluid balance chart, what it's supposed to denote in terms of their physiological status. So that's the patient record but then again we have other things that we have to capture we have to capture staff's attendance one because that links to pay you know we're not going to pay people if they're not attending unless they are certificated sick so we also have to monitor the amount of sickness they have and whether they're taking their annual leave or they're overtaking it or undertaking how much study leave people are going on compliance with statutory and mandatory training that we have to provide um, and which people are legitimately obliged to attend. Um, and also special training that people will do because they are working in specific divisions. So for instance, if you are an intensive care nurse, you only become an intensive care nurse, not because you're working in intensive care, but because you have done the intensive care higher education certificate, which in fact makes you the intensive care practitioner. So we are now required by the government um, to regularly report not only on our staffing levels and grade skill mix per shift per day, we are also now required to say, well, how many nurses have you got in your intensive care um, areas who've got the intensive care course? And how many who are working in paediatric intensive care have got the paediatric intensive care course? Or if they're working in neuro, have they got the neuro course or liver in the liver course? And anaesthetic recovery nurses, have they got the anaesthetic recovery course? So for somebody like myself who heads up on education, I have to make sure that our education budget reflects that service which the trust needs. And of course, it is all done through inputting into ICT and the digital skills. So that's another thing that we use digital skills for. I suppose from an organisational development point of view, the most important thing to remember is that as you go through, particularly in the NHS, although we do find that many of my colleagues who work in the private healthcare sector are using something similar to the knowledge skills framework that is part of the NHS Agenda for Change National Pay competencies. We then have to look at for particular bandings of staff, what core competencies do they need to have in order to not only meet the requirements for being appointed to that post, but for ongoing fulfilment of that role and then for, in terms of talent management, developing them on to the next graded post. And you'll see that we look at the Department of Health's leadership competencies. So management and leadership competencies, which are spelled out by them in terms of financial understanding, fiscal budgetary management, people management skills, leadership skills, resource skills, um, an understanding of change management, dealing with underperforming staff. All of these are specific competencies. I've just given you the headings, but they have specific identified competencies that branch out from under that umbrella heading. And it's part of my role with other members of the team to ensure that our staff receive that support and receive that ongoing development because they're going to need it and certainly do need it in today's changing healthcare system. We have something that we're introducing now into King's College Hospital University Trust, which is called the King's Way. And the reason we've done that is because we found there was a bit of a gap between our strategic vision 
and the implementation of that strategy and everybody in the organisation understanding where they were in relation to the operational issues in relation to the strategy. So we have come up with white belts, yellow belts, green belts, blue belts and black belts. Mm. All the ward accreditation system, everybody on that ward has got to be white belted competencies. Then for ward managers and upwards, so those senior staff nurses who want to be ward managers or those who are ward managers will be having their yellow belt status. Then if you want to go on to be a matron or a clinical nurse specialist, you will go on to have green belt. Nurse consultants will have blue belt skills. And again, they're all specifically designated. And this relates to how they have to be able to interpret things on ICT. And then people like myself are, are supposed to be black belts. So just watch it. Yeah. Um, now, what has that got to do with, with digital skills and ICT? Well, because at certain levels that you're at, you're expected to have more than just an understanding of how to switch the computer and printer on and how to use your password and input data. That's expected of everybody. That's the basics. And we do have training for those people who obviously have got the other skills that we need to employ them, but who haven't had as much access to a home computer as some people have. So they're not that PC literate. So we do have that foundational training. But then as you go up the promotional ladder, you have to not only be able to input the data that you require to input, you have to be able to pull off and interpret data. And the higher level you go, the more understanding of interpreting data, analysing data and asking questions of that data and noticing gaps in certain aspects of the data is what is expected of you. And those who are at director level, at trust board level, nurse directors, finance directors, HR directors, you name it, they must have that skill. So it's, n it, it's very important to have people management skills, don't get me wrong, it's vital, particularly in a human services industry like the NHS. But you're not going to get anywhere in your career these days if you cannot actually interpret data. And it is not unknown now at senior um, leadership appointments that you have an unseen printout of computer data relating to something and you're asked to analyse it and find out what might be going on and what recommendations you would make to the trust board for overcoming a deficit or so part of it is about can you spot and some of it's not that obvious to be to, <laughs> to be quite clear but can you spot what what the issue is then can you identify if actions being taken already to redress that issue or what would you recommend and much of that relates to not only a trust board report but working with your ICT information computer technology colleagues um, in actually addressing some of those issues yeah because ICT people are very good they will say we're very good at managing systems. We will, through procurement, obtain the best operational system for you to use. And these are changing all the time. So this costs big bucks, big money. And therefore, you know, as somebody who works the NHS, it's public money. We have to be good stewards of how we use that money. So they will often ask us and say, come and have a look at this system. We think it addresses the needs, but you are the professionals. What do you think? And that's particularly important with the doctors because doctors are, I know everybody's busy in the NHS, but they are extremely busy with ward rounds in operating theatres and outpatient departments and they do not have the time to bang um, keyboards to try and get some information out or to put something in to find nothing is working, you know they are the people who get particularly frustrated and we know from research that if PCs don't work it's the one thing that really winds most people up. Now I'm remarkably calm considering that most of my work's gone missing this morning but there we are. But they will get wound up and if this is about communication of ongoing patient care we need them to be working the system regularly. 
Um, and so you have to always focus on your doctors and give them their basic training of what they need um, because all they want is to be able to get information in, information out that helps with their clinical judgment making and which communicates to the registrars, communicates to pharmacy, communicates to occupational therapy, physiotherapy, members of the multidisciplinary team, what is happening about one particular patient. And in a university teaching hospital like King's, and there are quite a few of them around in London, um, you get complex patient care pathways. So you haven't just got one morbidity, one problem, you've got co 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 morbidity and you give somebody a drug that's supposed to sort something out and it gives them a complication so you give them another drug to counteract that and on and on and on it goes and the fact that we have patients who come to us internationally for treatment and also nationally we've got other professorial consultants from other hospitals referring patients to our specialist units there are a lot of people to communicate with and the one thing that um, when we have overseas visitors from China and Japan and places, one of the things they are fascinated by is how comprehensive our ICT system is and that we can communicate with GPs, we can communicate with other hospitals by email and actually share anatomical pictures of what's gone on with the patient or actual pictures taken at their operation site and results, you know, in a very contemporaneous time honoured way so there's no delays really so um, people appreciate that in terms of ongoing commissioning and the success of an organization because we only exist for patients so if we don't get patients being referred to us and patient flow there's no point in us being in posts um, what we find is that from the GP's <coughs> perspective the quicker they get information back to them about their particular patients the better they like it and that's one of the key things that um, ensures GPs keep continuing referring patients to us for the hips the knees you know their multiple sclerosis whatever it is as opposed to going elsewhere and some GPs do choose to go elsewhere in some hospitals you know so we can't take the fact that we're a hospital and that we've got a local catchment area as well as a wider national area we can't take it for granted you know you have to keep working at it all the time and one of the things that allows us to keep on top is ICT and digital skills and of course the final thing that we use um, from an employer's perspective we use um, ICT and digital skills is because of the plethora of online distance learning e-learning programs these are getting more and more advanced now and when you've got a lot of staff because I said we've got over 12,000 staff across five sites some of the ways we help them um, reach um, compliance with statutory and mandatory training is through these online learning systems particularly for updates so you spend a lot of time with your specialist subject matter expert trainers doing one-to-one -one training at the very beginning in the early stages of joining us particularly if they're making the transition from being a student nurse into a staff nurse or they come to us completely new to King's College Hospital from all over the country um, but for follow-up for two yearly updates and things you can often use very good interactive e-learning programs and of course finally we have got a simulation skills lab which is great with all these wonderful mannequins so we've got a mannequin that is a pregnant woman and we can turn the lie of the baby and we can show fetal heart rate dropping um, you know to help the midwives especially those in training, their clinical judgments. We've got another mannequin, which I love using with students, actually, because I've got the buttons, you see, and it can do projectile vomiting without warning anybody. And uh, it can do quite uh, odious diarrhea as well without warning anybody. And all the things that um, poorly patients who can't help it when they're poorly physiologically, their bodily functions alter, um, we can do the full range. And sometimes I go into overdrive and I give them the full range and give them ectopic beats in the heart rate and all sorts of plummeting BPs and all sorts of things. And uh, yeah, <laughs> really put students and others um, who are 
hoping to go for more advanced training. So if we're saying you're going to be a clinical nurse specialist or a nurse consultant or a consultant midwife, you've got to have more advanced clinical judgment skills, not only be able to talk what you might do, but show what you're doing in action, because that's how people really learn. They still learn by being alongside somebody who's in the know about what they're doing. And part of my job, which is a very privileged position to be in, is to make sure that people have access to being able to get that learning to enable them to do their job um, as effectively and as efficiently as you and I would want them to do it if we were in that unfortunate position of being a patient. So a lot to think about from an employer's perspective, but our biggest challenge at the moment is making sure that we've got sufficient um, ICT trainers for all the various aspects of training, not just in how to use the system, but also how to get data out in the business intelligence unit that we have, the BIU, how to interpret it. A lot of effort, it's behind the scenes. A lot of people in hospitals see what goes on at the clinical coalface. Um, but there's a lot of people, like myself, who are, if you like, active behind the scenes, making sure that we are helping what goes on there at the clinical coalface. And uh, certainly I feel that sometimes our uh, electronic ICT trainers don't get quite um, the recognition that they should have. So I hope I've done them justice this afternoon. Thank you very much.